The jump from quantum physics to classical physics, it's like jumping. It's like jumping from classical music all the way to death metal. And in the case of the evolution of music from classical music to death metal, it took like hundreds of years to make that progression. And you can watch the lineage of musicians learning from each other and building and experimenting. And you see over the course of centuries, you go from like Mozart to death metal. <laughs> the, the revolution between classical physics and quantum physics happened in less than 25 years. In 1901, you have Max Planck proposing that the emission of radiation is quantized, and he introduces it as an ugly hack in the equations just to make things work. And in, by 1924, you have a full quantum mechanical theory of subatomic particles. Less than 25 years. That's one generation. So this isn't just scientists uh, who are uh, like fans of Mozart and then go create death metal. These are Mozart himself. This is, these are classical musicians. These are physicists who are trained in classical physics, who know nothing but classical physics, who know nothing but a classical worldview, and then create out of whole cloth in the span of one generation a completely different radical theory of how nature works. Quantum mechanics is nothing like classical mechanics. All of our intuition, all of our knowledge about how the macroscopic wor world works simply doesn't apply to quantum mechanics. So it's like Mozart himself going from writing symphonies at the beginning of his career and just a couple decades later thrashing on an electric guitar doing death metal. It's like Mozart himself creating death metal. That's how big of a revolution, that's how big of a switch this was. And prior to World War I, there were some pokes and prods into the subatomic world and we, got, we were seeing how the role of quantization was important, that light itself may be quantized, that the energy levels of electrons inside of atoms may be quantized, but no one really knew what to do with this. A big break came in 1924 with French physicist Louis de Broglie. He proposed a radical, radical idea as part of his PhD thesis, by the way. He, he looked at Einstein's work with the photon, where Einstein said, look, uh, uh, light itself is composed of these tiny, tiny little particles. We will call them photons. And they, they definitely act like particles. And then you get a bunch of photons together and you get the wave-like nature of light. And so light itself has both a particle and a wave nature. De Broglie said, if it goes for light, why doesn't it go for matter? After all, light is quantized, and we're seeing that matter can be quantized inside of an atom. Maybe matter itself has a wave nature. Maybe what we think of as little particles are actually some sort of combination between particles and waves. And he wasn't too crazy to propose this because he said, look, for light, uh, if you look at a photon, there's a relationship between the energy of the photon and its wavelength. You can write that down. Well, if, if a bullet is moving or a train is moving or I am moving or an electron is moving, it has energy, it has kinetic energy. So maybe we can use the same relation to derive its wavelength. This idea got the backing of Einstein. Otherwise, I think it, people would not have noticed it, would not have paid attention, and we would have had to wait another few years for someone to think of the idea. But Einstein liked de Broglie's idea, and so that made it very popular. And then immediately there sprung into a debate, like, okay, if electrons have a wave nature, what is it waving? You know, the physicists, they liked de Broglie's idea because it helped explain the Bohr model of the atom. Bohr model said electrons have to be in very specific orbitals, very specific distances from the nucleus. De Broglie's idea said, oh, it has to be, the electrons have to be this distance and that distance and this distance because that's the only place where you can have standing waves. The wave nature of the electron, that's the only place where it can fit. Oh, that's interesting. But what exactly is waving when it comes to an electron? And 
in my interpretation of the history of quantum mechanics, there are two general camps emerge. One camp led by people like Bohr, Heisenberg, Max Born, a few others, said, forget it. Stop trying to interpret what is happening in the subatomic world. Like you're sitting here scratching your head saying, what is waving uh, in an electron? What does it mean for matter to have a wave? And they said, stop trying to visualize and imagine what's happening in the subatomic world and just develop tools that can make calculations and make predictions. So in fact, in, in that year, or sorry, in 1925, Heisenberg develops the first complete theory of quantum mechanics, and there are no waves in it whatsoever. In fact, his formulation of quantum mechanics of how subatomic particles behave are, is entirely based on matrices, these, these two-dimensional arrays of numbers. It's almost like a, an algebraic spreadsheet. Um, and through this language of mathematics, he was able to predict and explain almost every single spectrum from every single element. So by far, it was a highly successful theory of how subatomic particles worked. But at the time, this kind of mathematics using matrices was, was very uh, unknown. In fact, Heisenberg invented the use of matrices to, to do this and without even realizing that he was inventing matrices and that mathematicians had already invented it. It would take his advisor, Niels Bohr, to look at his work and say, by the way, uh, this is a matrix. And he's like, what is a matrix? And you know, conversations ensued. But no waves, no particles even, just focused on observation, observables, experiments, inputs and outputs. It was a machine for generating results. But no one at the time really knew what to do with Heisenberg's work because the math was so foreign and so weird. Like, yeah, it got results. So it was obviously a correct or on the right track, but, but what do we make of it? And in response to that, Heisenberg said, don't make anything of it. It's a tool for agreeing with results, for agreeing with experiments and making predictions. What else do you want? Get off my back, man. And that leads me to the second camp who took de Broglie's idea of matter waves and really started to inquire, what is the nature of a matter wave? When I say an electron has a wave property, what in the world am I saying? What is doing the waving? And how does that wave evolve with time? How does that wave interact with matter around it? And this camp was led by people like Albert Einstein, like de Broglie himself, and by Schrodinger. Schrodinger looked at the wave nature of matter and asked, how does this wave evolve? And that has how he came across and developed the Schrodinger equation, which is just the evolution of this waves in time. It's basically Newton's laws, but for a complex wave with some extra mathy bits inserted. His idea of matter waves and the evolution of matter waves also worked, was also able to predict atomic spectra. So it was also on the right track. But still, even though he had a solution for what this matter wave was, it wasn't exactly clear, or sorry, he had a solution for what the matter wave would do. It wasn't exactly clear what the matter wave was. He wasn't able to answer that fundamental question. So he kept probing and kept probing. He realized over the course of his investigations that Heisenberg's matrix approach that no one really understood and his approach based on waves could actually be translated back and forth to each other. You can do some mathematical transformations to get matrices and you can turn those over into waves and go back and forth. This was a major revelation, but still he couldn't say what was waving. He thought, Schrodinger thought, that the, the wave of an electron was a physical object, that the electron was literally smeared out over space. Uh, but it would take later theoretical insights due to Max Born to make the connection that we now have of the modern understanding of what is a matter wave, and that's a wave of probability. That when you are solving the Schrodinger equation, when you are solving these wave equations, and you're asking what, when I say matter has a wave-like property, and you say, well, what is that wave? What does it look like? What does it do? I say it's a wave of probability that tells me where I will find the electron the next time I go looking for it. About a decade later, 
Uh, another genius polymath, John von Neumann, would synthesize Schrodinger's approach, Heisenberg's approach, also Dirac's approach, which I haven't mentioned, and develop the modern postulates of quantum mechanics, the modern theory of quantum mechanics as physicists understand it. But these fundamental questions remained. What is the best approach to quantum mechanics? Do I try to visualize what's happening and try to imagine what's happening inside of an atom and develop this like wave-based picture and what are the waves? Or do I just shut up and calculate and not stop trying to pretend I can visualize or imagine what's happening in the subatomic world? Those debates continue to the present day and they started right there in 1925 with the development of quantum mechanics. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe, and go to patreon.com slash pmsutter to keep supporting the show. I truly do appreciate it, and I'll see you next time.